Welcome back, everyone, to the stories for this week. But first, a note from our sponsors, because this segment is brought to you by the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training and research. Visit SANS.org to learn more. And by Tenable Network Security, the creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Jumpstart your security program today and evaluate Security Center's CV, the continuous monitoring solution. Find out more at Tenable.com. And by Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at BlackHillsInfosec.com and request a quote today. Besides, Tampa is happening. This is a four-night cruise. The conference is a full two days at sea and a stop in Cozumel, New Mexico. Day one, you depart. Day two is at sea. Did I, did I say New Mexico again? You know what? They're just going to have to move the conference to New Mexico because that's obviously where it should be. But it's not. It's in Cozumel, Mexico. It departs in the afternoon. Your day two is at sea. Your day three is in Cozumel, Mexico. Day four is at sea and it's besides day two. And then... You're back in Tampa. So, <clears throat> that's that. I think that's cool. Anyway, we've got lots of cool stuff to talk about. I don't know if it's so much cool as it is interesting, hilarious, sad. It's going to be an emotional roller coaster. Hopefully, we have Jack Daniel back, and he's not whoever that person was in the whoever previous. Whoever that strange optimist was. Whoever that was. Um, we want to talk breaches first. Web.com is hacked. 93,000 people? Million people? Thousand. Can't be million. 93,000 customers have been compromised. And nobody cares. So, next story. <laughs> yeah, but is there any purient sexual interest in that? So, let's talk about the other breach. They were penetrated, so to speak. <laughs> and it's okay to make fun of them and ridicule them, and it's cool that people are killing themselves because they uh, don't meet our moral code because we're all morally upstanding motherfuckers. And so it's okay to revel in the agony of other people over their indiscretions on the Internet and completely ignore everything else in the fucking world like the XP system <clears throat> still running on a third of your network and uh, just get all wound the fuck up about Ashley Madison and make fun of yes. Brian Krebs. This is the Jack that I argue. know. He's back. Have, He's have back. Fucking <laughs> journalists sniping at each other without the balls <laughs> to call each other by name. It's fucking awesome. It's our industry at its best. It's why the, pol the politicians ignore us. And God damn it, it's why they should ignore us. <laughs> Fuck. Wow. There was a lot in there. I do want to say that two individuals associated with the leak of Ashley Madison customer details. Was that details, better, Michael? That was was that more what you were looking for? Um, have oh, reportedly, like they've taken their lives. They've committed suicide. They've killed themselves. However you want to say it. I don't know what's least or most politically correct, but they're dead now. They're dead now by their own hands. Is that politically correct or not? Maybe. Okay. Oh, yeah, anyway. but wait. The, the, the people that have splattered this across the news and tabloids, are they complicit in that? Are they accessories in, in these deaths? I, I, don't, I don't know, Jack. I don't know. I don't know why that story's in there. Other than, I thought it was. Do you have anything vulnerable to MSA 08067 in your environment? Then turn off the fucking internet, fix that, and then come back to Ashley Madison. God damn it. Oh, boy. <laughs> Was what? it Josh Duggar was in the Ashley Madison breach too? Probably. Who knows? I you know, think. I, can you guys? Did you guys read about? Did you guys read about the Josh Duggar thing? Yeah. Who? I think you what? You know that show, The Duggars? I I, I had to go read about this. <clears throat> the Duggars, where they have like nineteen kids. You're gonna no, and, and oh, wait, me. Oh, wait, you're gonna tell me that somebody on television is a fucking hypocrite? Oh my god! Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, this is this is likely the this biggest. This is the hard hitting hypocrite. news right here. This is like the hypocrite. This one takes the cake, right? Because they're you know I, he worked for some I don't know doing good kind of job somewhere. I forget exactly where. And they're a Christian family, and they portrayed values on TV. And he's the eldest brother. Apparently, yeah, this story is just weird. I didn't put it in the show notes, and here I am talking about But yeah, So I read about him. He is apparently, uh, I don't know if he was ever convicted, but the story goes he was <clears throat> molesting his little sisters while they're growing up. And then they found out 
like what before the show was aired, they found out, and the local sheriff got involved, gave him a stern talking to, because then it turns out that the local sheriff later, a couple of years later, was convicted was his on name child boss hog. I just yeah, ex- so the <laughs> sheriff Jack was convicted of child pornography, so gave this guy a pass. Did Bandit take his daughter-in-law to be away across the state Then I think he was part of the Ashley Madison (laughs) hack because he was cheating on his wife. Then this porn star slash stripper comes out and says that Josh Duggar paid her to have sex and that it was like rough and awful. Yeah. So that's Josh Duggar. You ever watched the Duggars? No, I've never watched the Duggars. Yeah, Yeah, so don't. Just I, I don't watch a lot of TV. I watch some horrible reality shows, which are unreal, but I still find them entertaining. <coughs> um, what uh, was the I, other thing about Ashley Madison? Oh, their ex-CTO, so in, as part of the breach and the leak, their ex-CTO is, uh, found that he had sent emails saying they ha- he, in fact, admitted to hacking into the competition. Nerve.com? Something like that. Hacked into the competition and saying, you know, sh- they're having this conversation email like, oh, I hacked into them. Yeah, they're really vulnerable. Yeah, I pulled all of their customer information. And then wait, he's wait, like, time out. So somebody that runs a website dedicated to enabling morally questionable behavior had engaged co- in morally, morally questionable, questionable activities. Yes. Holy shit. If that's Let me not find news. my shocked face. <laughs> So, but then they have emails saying, well, well, should we tell them about their security vulnerabilities? And then it, no, no one really answers. So my guess is they never told their com- competition about those security vulnerabilities and probably put it on that's, a pace bin. Okay, well, that's all right, because how many people listening right now have told somebody at your company or a company that's paid you to tell them about vulnerabilities about vulnerabilities and been ignored? So, you yeah. know, <laughs> right? So. It probably wouldn't have mattered if he's, they told he's, him. He's living the life of a professional pen tester, right? It's <laughs> like, fuck. I could tell them, but they won't do anything, so why bother? Why bother? <laughs> <laughs> uh, fuck. Well, they're probably listening to him now. Hey, what do you guys think about the fact that they came out and said, hey, I'll give you $500,000 if you help us catch uh, No, they didn't even say $500,000 oh, yeah, Canadian a, dollars, well, right? Okay. So. <laughs> What the fuck? So it's like so fucking. Oh. You, you, you got to kiss. You, you got to kiss right? a fish. You got to drink screech and kiss a, kiss a fish to collect on it or some fucking thing. <laughs> they're, they're like four people listening, laughing at that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, Newfies, eh? Um, <clears throat> wow. <geez. laughs> yeah, Jack's back. I don't know what yeah. you did, Paul. <laughs> Something extreme. It's the total extreme. It's extreme, Jack. We love it. It's awesome. Anything else on Ashley Madison? We went to a really dark place, Jack. <laughs> we did. You really we did. <laughs> okay. Change. I'm trying to make up for the first hour. <laughs> let's talk about something more uplifting, and let's talk about flash vulnerabilities. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it's like this. I have to say something, because people are going to say stuff to us, because stuff. Years ago, there, there were really logical reasons to use Flash as a platform. Yes. 99% of the desktops and laptops had Flash installed. And, yep. and Flex was awesome. Flex was, it Flex? Flex, Flex was, was powerful. Yeah. Um, and uh, those days are long gone. Long gone. Well, because HTML5 really wasn't developed, and all these... Rest and JSON and XML uh, RPC right. things weren't so as one advanced. Of the, one of the challenges, yeah. though, is that you know now we, because of HTML5 and every different technology that that empowers, we are back to browser wars. I don't know if uh, anybody listening uh, it tries to run any one uh, browser on any single device, but you know I've I, I have I think my I have my iPhone only has the default Safari browser and Chrome on it. Everything else that I own has at least three browsers on it, except for my Surface RTs that don't have any browsers at all because they only support Internet Explorer. I, so what, but one of the so silly it's time is gone, right? So we've we've traded it off, but they're the one of the beauties of that diversity was ninety nine point nine percent of all laptop of all desktop systems had Flash on them. Which meant that you had cross-platform exploitability. 
right? And it was a disaster once we realized what a piece the, of shit it was. Do the numbers of vulnerabilities matter? Because I've got, I don't know, I'm trying to make sense of some of this data. Uh, if you go to cvedetails.com, which is a great website uh, if you're security nerds like we are. Um, they are we on a sales call? No, so vulnerability numbers don't matter. <laughs> So they I list be honest, God damn it. They list the <clears throat> products with the most vulnerabilities that they've logged in the database. Does anyone want to without going there take venture to guess what software has the most logged number of vulnerabilities according to CVE details? Fortran. Now you're right you're on the right track, Mike, in talking about technology that are older, right? Because if we do the operating system comparison, like, there's more disclosed vulnerabilities for XP than there are for Windows 10. That's just an age thing. That doesn't really mean much. But the number one on this list is the Linux kernel. Well, of course. Yeah, because yeah. it, it just lines of code and age. Age. Okay. Damn it, why? And, and th I mean this in the best <laughs> possible way because not every, but it's... Linux kernel developers don't care uh, about security? <laughs> not even going there. <laughs> <laughs> it, there is a lot of uh, code that's contributed by yep. people who are not. Uh, I don't want to say amateur because that's wrong. Because they're really, I mean, they're professionals. But, if they're running kernel stuff, they're not amateur, right? Right. Yeah. They're not amateurs. They're they're skilled people, but they're trying to solve problems. They don't have the the commercial. I mean, there's a lot of commercial backing companies like IBM and Red Hat mm -hmm. and. Companies large and small contribute, but it's it's different. Be, the right. open source is different. <laughs> Do you want it? Also, takes pieces. It's not all pure. Some of that is some of that is BSD code. Some of that right. is Unix code that's been ported. Um, Do you want to say <laughs> Adventure? I guess is the number two. Number two is also open source, and it's a web browser. Well, Mozilla? Firefox. Firefox. Firefox is number two on well, the, the most vulnerabilities. It's, it's wide open. It's age, right? I mean, Firefox has been around for a long time. Firefox, Firefox came before Chrome. Firefox, yeah, predates Chrome by several years. Yep. Uh, it also, you know, now is professionally maintained, but it started out as, you know, a, a open source. And it's, you know, highly extensible. And is now are these straight up? You know, is that Firefox itself? Also, Firefox, by the nature of their foundation, is transparent. Right. So transparency is a factor in these. Yep. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's not like it's not like Microsoft, who now refused to tell us anything about fucking patches. Windows 10, you want to know what you're patching? Shut up. Give us your private data. Fuck you. Patch this. Well, um, you know what's interesting, Jack, is number six is Sea Monkey and number seven is Thunderbird, all from the Mozilla project. And I don't know if that's because they're more transparent about disclosing vulnerabilities. It plays into these numbers as well. And I don't think that's these numbers... That's part of it. It's yeah, got to be part, part of it. it right? I mean, but we are, don't know. I don't know how exact these numbers are either. I mean, this right. is just CVE details, counting CVEs. Right. So take that for what it's worth. Uh, number eight was IE. Uh, and number 10 was Internet Explorer. So I'm not sure what the deal is there. Do you combine those two numbers? If you do, it puts Internet Explorer and IE at the top of the list because they're about 600 each. Puts them at 1,200. Um, kind of interesting. Flash, coincidentally enough, is 435, putting it at number 20. Uh, Java, I'm sorry, Java's number 20 at 435. Flash is 15 at 545. Okay, but we can, uh, let's look at something. So the Linux kernel is, follow me on this one, only installed on Linux systems. True, true. Where's Flash installed? Everywhere. <laughs> Everywhere. Everywhere, right? Yeah, so I those mean, 435 vulnerabilities really matter because Flash and Java are both cross-platform. Cross -platform. Yeah, that's, that's like you, you don't need to develop the skills to own Windows and BSD and Linux. and Right. You go after the application. And BlackBerry, right? <laughs> you just go after Flash. Go, go after Java and see what you own, or go after Flash and see what you own, right? Can we do, I mean, so Gavin Millard, uh, who's been on the show before, a fellow co-worker at Tenable Network Security, it's really funny, wrote an article about Flash, and now Flash should die. Basically summarizing a lot of things we've said on the show before about Flash and how it should die. The ironic part is, if you go watch a video on the same site that published his article, it requires Flash. Flash. <laughs> <laughs> So I have. Uh, you, you know my favorite question, right, Jack? I, just 
Just circle back to me when you're done. No, go ahead. Good, good. Well, I, I like to ask what's the problem we're trying to solve. Um, and what I've started to notice is that if you want to change We're trying to solve internet rage. Don't, don't get all fucking deep on us. I already blew that. So <laughs> that one we're not going <laughs> to Hey, you had your happy time. I'm trying to mind. All right, go Here, ahead, Here's the Michael. thing. I, I saw an article that, that breezed by this week, and I skimmed it because it was kind of curious, and it was something to the effect of, yeah, but who still needs Flash, right? It was kind of like the counterpoint because – Clearly, uh, clearly the chorus is growing. Get rid of Flash, and we've uh, extolled a number of reasons why. So I kind of looked at it. I said, well, yeah, actually, what's the reason for keeping it? Number one reason for keeping Flash, DRM. People can control stuff with it that they can't control other ways. I mean, unless you want everybody to have Silverlight on their machines, which I don't, I'm oh, not convinced God. that's yeah, a better so. solution. <laughs> so, but so, so the interesting thing then is where, where I think we have an opportunity uh, it, from a, a security leadership perspective is to say, Okay, so what's the solution? I mean, if you've got a company that's using Flash, but there's there's potentially a reason for it, right? It could just be because you already have your content set up that way. It just kind of works. You don't you don't want to change. Okay, got it. That's probably an easier shift. But for the companies that are looking at it for its purported benefits, what is their alternative? Because I think if Silverlight. we can solve that problem, we'll get people off it. You know, so there you go. But, well, also, it, it depends on the nature of the problem. So unlike... Internet Explorer 6, right? Um, Flash is a lot easier to control via the network. There are a lot of systems that will let you block Flash. Um, it, now, in some cases, you're going to have to proxy that traffic. And in the age of certificate pinning, running honest-to-goodness proxies that crack mm -hmm. open your SSL and TLS becomes... Believe, I, I understand the level of pain. The, I mean, the level of pain doing it in your own household is uh, torture. But if you're protecting <laughs> things that really matter, you can do that. And if you right. want to lock systems down, uh, don't. You know, I've got an application that was developed in Flash, and our, we run our entire fucking business on it, and we can't do without it. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that we keep the latest version of Flash on everything. Our patch management program is going to prioritize Flash. To all the, you know, the, the Flash client is going to get updated. We're going to look at what we've done. And anybody that doesn't need to access Flash on the Internet, we're going to block it at the gateway, perimeter, firewall, whatever the hell that LED but if that's deep, SSL like, traffic, what you're saying is it's hard. SSL traffic, yeah. you're going to have to crack it open. You're going to have to I was just going to say, break it. Yeah. <clears throat> so you got to proxy it. You should be, you know... By, by the way, I, I, all right, I'm going to channel, uh, you know, it's not really channeling random anymore, but, you know, if you're not cracking that traffic open and looking at it, why do you filter anyway, really? Mm -hmm. just I mean, why, why add well, the bump in the wire? I, if, you're, if, you're not doing, if you're not cracking it open, and yes, oh my God, that's agony. It, with the number of pin certificates, and I love the idea of certificate pinning, because if Microsoft pins certificates for Windows Update, mm -hmm. that solves problems. And mm -hmm. if Google pins certificates for their updates, that solves problems. And if Mozilla does, that solves problems. And if Adobe does... Oh wait, they've proven they can't keep control of their certificates. Oh shit. And when when channel 73's news server pins certificates and mm -hmm. I don't trust you to pin certificates. Um, well, what's concerning for me is the inability of us to switch and change technology. I mean, that's oh, really what it comes down to. Is, right? is like Mike's where, asking the question right, like we need to get some off flash. Old, this is where some old person has to say something like if only we'd known 20 years ago that BGP had insecurities, we could have moved <laughs> off it by now. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, right. I mean, but the, the, it, you know, what you pull out, point out, Paul, is, is interesting because we, we learned this in Y2K. We've learned it with yeah. Windows XP. We've now learned it with uh, every iteration of thing that, you know, we go, it's been a decade and people are still using it. Of, of course they are. Mm -hmm. So what it means in it too, I mean, so now the mm -hmm. thing that's interesting is this article that was, it was not in defense of Flash. It was more of a, let me just, you know, hey, let's just explain why it's going to take some time. They even said, look, this will phase out. Um, th there are a lot of reasons where Flash was awesome. And there's a lot of things that you can do better without it now in terms of consistency you experience across mobile devices and speed and, and everything else. But what I think is interesting is, 
you know, when I like to ask that question, what problem are we trying to solve? One of the things that I'm also looking at, um, especially working with startups, is to say, hey, what are you doing today? And what do you envision things doing in the future? And and what's your plan for that migration? What's your plan for that expansion? I think that's an opportunity where we get better, too, because instead of coming in as security people saying, no, 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 that's not, just say, hey, cool. Hey, uh, so when this blows up and goes gangbusters, uh, what's next? Yeah, how, how, do, you, how, do, you how do you become that? more agile? I think agile is the word that really summarizes what we're talking about, right? Is we're only, only we're designing if you do it something with big data. Yeah. yeah. Uh. Well, whether we're designing something <laughs> like software or it's a software company, a startup, how do yeah. we become more agile and not as reliant on the technology and easily let our ourselves move off of it? You know, is there is there technologies or strategies that you recommend yeah, to, to let us well, do that? You're talking I mean, about Flash. Um, I was sort of not really trolling Alex, but trolling the conversation that he started, Alex Stamos. So he moved to mm -hmm. Facebook and made this statement that it was time for Flash to die. And so I, I tweeted. And, it, it, you know, Twitter, you don't always get all the context in that you want. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Tom... Patrick called me out, and he was right because I didn't make it clear. Um, you know, and I asked the question: If you want to, if you want to kill Flash, why would you go to Facebook instead of going to Adobe? Mm. Oh. And but the point is, my point, which I didn't make clear, so I'll, I'll clarify here: Alex has a better chance of killing Flash than Adobe at Facebook. Mm -hmm. Than he would at Adobe because Adobe's not going to let him kill that. Oh yeah, no, I agree. But at Facebook, he can drive Flash out of the infrastructure as far as he can get mm -hmm. away with. Right. Drive Flash away. Drive Flash away. Drive Flash away. Dry up the demand side for Flash. Mm -hmm. So um, I worded it poorly when I, in this tweet. This has been many weeks ago now. But but you know, there's an example. There's a way. He, you know, Facebook has the power to really dry up. You want to talk about the power to do it? The iPhone. Yes. The iPhone it's has critical. done more to kill Flash yep. than anything else. Because, poof, the iPhone doesn't support <clears throat> Flash. Guess what? Everybody has to build websites that work on the yes, iPhone because yeah. you're not going to lose the iPhone market share. You're not going right. to lose the iOS market share. Android follows suit. It's, all right, if you want people Where? to see your stuff. Uh, at Security Weekly and Stoey Geeks and all of our web properties, we're we're almost there. Um, it's not easy. No, well, so <laughs> but it depends on the provider. Uh, so uh, Ustream, if you're watching this live feed, if you go to it with a Flash enabled browser, it will present you with Flash. If you have a Flash blocker, mm -hmm. it's not going to let you watch the show. However, if you change your user agent to say that you're an iPad, magically they give you an HTML5 version. And all so the rest of our videos on our site are from YouTube, which is fully HTML5 supported. So we are so HTML5. You just got to trick it. Uh, I've had this HTML5. laptop almost a year. Mm -hmm. um, I have never installed Flash on Firefox. Mm -hmm. um, and Firefox also has uh, request policy and no script on it, mm -hmm. which is really cool because the Internet is a blank white page with an error message. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you need a different browser for that. Uh, virtual machine what? Anyway, yes. so um, uh, it's funny because you go to a lot of sites, and uh, I actually see it on, on slow connections because I travel a lot, and I'm at hotels where you pay exorbitant rates for Internet that sucks. Um, and you see this thing, uh, flash not supported, bada, bada, and then it thinks about it for a second mm -hmm. and gives you the content anyway. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, oh, okay. Well, we, we can interfere with our own ad revenue by clinging to Flash, mm -hmm. or we can move forward. Right. And like you said, you know, YouTube, um, I rarely even, if, it, if I'm on a low-speed connection, you'll sometimes see it say, uh, what? oh, okay, here you go, right? Other sites do see it. It's like uh, the TweetDeck app doesn't support Flash and embedded Flash anymore. and. Mm -hmm. If there are other things, it's like, okay, fine, that's that's fine, I'm okay without it. And I find myself more and more often saying, oh, you want me to enable Flash? I guess I don't want to watch. Right. So the irony in all this is that cloud and mobile are the forcing function to improve security, even as security professionals decry cloud and mobile as causing them to lose control. 
It's it's true. It's an I interesting statement, Mike. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, yeah. I've already pissed off enough people. Let's piss <laughs> off more. So uh, I don't know that you know real true professionals are going to get wound up about it because professionals see the opportunities as well as the challenges. <laughs> well, I think certainly we've talked about how cloud improves security, even though. Yep. Can. Uh, it can. Can improve. Provides an opportunity to improve. Security. And I, I think what people are really wound up about is the privacy in the cloud. Can someone, as my cloud neighbor, see? It's like session management in a web application. Sure. The same people who have web applications that allow very poor session management. In fact, oh, in the Ashley Madison breach, the CTO that hacked into the other site said, hey, when I hack into the other site, I can flip any user i can like be a, uh, flip any user from paid to not paid uh in their system right it's like bugs like that exist in web applications all the time and those same people that have all those web applications that are vulnerable will cry that well in a cloud environment you know someone can find an exploit for the hypervisor and and just jump into my cloud and i can't have that poor level of security when in reality that doesn't really happen a lot if Ever. And when it does, they fix it really fast. And when they fix it really fast, they fix it for everyone without you having to apply a patch, which speaks to how poor local patch management is for people. So in a way, you're right, Mike, the cloud can provide, as you say, Jack, a lot more security. I've just I've been spending some time um, specifically looking at it. And it, it's uh, Laurie McVitie gave me the language of the forcing function. But, but the more I look at it, what I've come to realize I did a, a panel a couple of weeks or so ago, and it was interesting because in that panel, I realized that if you're a cloud company, this was a, a cloud provider that was a security-focused solution, and uh, the the CSO was pointing out she can she can patch within like minutes. Mm -hmm. But when I pushed on, well, come on, hold on, companies are having this problem. Well, sure, because if your server in your organization has got to serve 15 different functions, it's hard to unpack what it can do. Oh, but in in your virtualized cloud environment, uh, it does one thing really well: easier to harden, easier to patch, easier to monitor, easier to detect when something goes wrong. It's kind of like, oh, I I get it now. So I think there's a lot of stuff we can do. Yeah, I think um, cloud was the big thing many years ago, and it was the topic in a lot of security conferences. But I think now. To a large extent, there's going to see a lot more adoption of the technology because I think it helps us way m even more so today than it, it, it did back. Or maybe it was just misunderstanding of it. Well, especially with uh, with the, the the talent shortage or the the mm -hmm. uh, the perceived need for more people. If if you can start to outsource functions with a higher level of confidence and free yourself up to work on uh, higher value tasks, I, I think it's a great opportunity. But you know, what I will tell you that's interesting because I've kind of slid back into going to conferences this year. When we ask people, hey, how many of you trust the cloud? The hands still largely stay down. Mm -hmm. There's an overwhelming majority of security professionals who are not yet comfortable with it for a variety of reasons. But I think I think the writing's on the wall. It's it's coming, and but what I'm trying to point out is I, I think there's some benefit to it. I mean, Jack's right. There's a caveat. Can be right. We can use the the, the slightly softer I, language, but I think great. The, let's let's advocate for it. Then I, I think a better question, which uh, kind of puts the burden where it belongs, might be instead of you know, do you trust the cloud or something that nebulous? Do you trust your organization's ability to securely deploy on the cloud? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right way to ask it. Because that's um, there are obviously people doing that, right? It, it's there, there are also people that everything in the cloud's encrypted. Okay, who does the key management? Oh, our cloud service provider. Oh, okay. Yeah, but uh, uh, so I mean, if so, you're if you, so you don't your understand own... security fundamentals, in that you're keeping your key material on a production server effectively, right? You know, mm. there's a, there's a lot of that sort of fundamental. People forget the the basics. Um, you know, it depends on your threat model, but yeah, whatever. Um, what are you trying to find a story or something? WordPress. <laughs> I want to talk oh, about yeah. WordPress. <laughs> Can we talk about WordPress? We never Wait, talk about is, WordPress. Are there any vulnerabilities in WordPress? So there was a um, – this one is interesting because the way that it worked was they had an exploit for Flash. And the way they got you to 
um, it basically pwn you with this exploit for Flash because they hacked into a bunch of WordPress sites and they put an iframe in there that loaded their Flash exploit into your browser. So they found all the web, you know, a lot of WordPress websites that were previous to version 4.2. They found the vulnerability. They inserted their iframe in there and then they pwned you via Flash and built up a, what is it called? It's the Neutrino Exploit Kit. Uh, researchers at Zeke Scaler uh, reported an uptick in it, and that's because they used WordPress to distribute it, which I thought was interesting. Check out the Z Scaler report. It was very good. Lots of pretty pictures, and uh, they reverse engineered the exploit and stuff. It was pretty cool. Um, I want to talk about smart home because nobody cares. It's kind of funny. I was having a conversation with my uh, neighbor this morning at the bus stop, and he said, you know... My house is getting old now, and my appliances are dying. And he's like, my stove has Wi-Fi on it. And he turned to me, he's like, I don't understand why my stove needs Wi-Fi. He's like, but it has it. And I'm like, it's interesting because you are like the poster child for what I've talked about in my uh, presentations that I've given all these security conferences. When I've told people, we're going to see this huge surge in all of these devices that are, are smart enabled, that are Wi-Fi enabled, that have these embedded systems in them that are horribly vulnerable because, guess what? When your stove dies, you're going to get one with Wi-Fi. And then today, here's my neighbor telling me, yeah, my new stove has Wi-Fi. It's like when I'm cooking stuff in the oven, I can control it from my smartphone and like turn it off. He's like, it's kind of ridiculous. I'm like, hey, you know that stuff is really vulnerable. He's like, so you're going to like hack into my stove and like, like crank up the, you know, turn the stove on and stuff? Like maybe. <laughs> So then I was reading about uh, just this morning where Samsung, the smart fridge, yes. they did some hacking on that uh, at DEF CON. So, and I think smart fridges are friggin' awesome. Like if I can get a video feed from my refrigerator while I'm at the supermarket, that's cool. I want to see what's in my refrigerator while I'm shopping. Like that's a great use case for smart technology, Mr. Jack, old cranky pants. Bear with me. Because so, it's, it's, it's impossible to open the damn door while you're making a shopping list, right? Well, that's too much work, Jack. That is a lot it's of just, work. It is way too much work. So what... Um, Besides, everybody knows that there are only two proper ways to go shopping. One, you're fucking starving, and you end up having to, like, string three carts together as a train, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I don't know why we have six boxes of, of ding-dongs. Uh, and the other <laughs> one is, which is much more economical... Is you take your your spouse, your significant other, and and family out to dinner, and you eat a big meal, and then you go grocery shopping, and you pick up like half a gallon of milk, and six eggs, and then you go home, and there's no food for the week. Uh, that's the <laughs> or, only way families or work, right? You <laughs> go shopping at any time with the two year old, oh, yeah. and I guarantee you that it'll be the quickest <laughs> shopping experience of your entire life. <laughs> yeah, it's, there's I'm it's completely random the stuff. That they put at the grab range of a two-year-old stuck in the shopping cart. There's no science in that at all, is there? Evil bastards. And if you give them like your phone, or God forbid they get a hold of your phone, like my two-year-old took my wife's phone and just hucked it across the supermarket because he didn't want to be there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do that stuff, too. Yeah, that makes for a shorter shopping trip, too. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Uh, um, but the, so, the one I like is the shop of the, the the ones that have the little scan it machines yeah. that you scan as you put them in the cart. Yeah. I like watching the parents freak out when they realize their kid has been scanning everything <laughs> down the aisle as they go. They're like, <laughs> bing, 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 all the way down the aisle, and they're like, they're looking at it, and it looks like there's $700 four thousand, yeah, there's seven hundred dollars <laughs> worth of food, and they have a box of graham crackers <laughs> in the cart. You know? um, the two year olds already <laughs> eaten half right, of them. Right, yeah. Exactly. It's like, ah, um, <laughs> so this smart fridge, apparently the in the presentation, is not they, so smart. Well, they said they tried to reverse engineer the firmware, get the firmware off the chip, and they they're still working on that. And they didn't do that. And what they figured out was that um, the, apparently the certificate and en encryption from the fridge that talks to the cloud. Um, so the refrigerator gives you your Google Calendar on your refrigerator because everyone needs that. I mean, I need to see my calendar on my refrigerator. In order right. to do that, they need your Gmail credentials, which are apparently attackers can do a man-in-the-middle attack and sniff your Gmail credentials from your refrigerator, which I thought was pretty cool. <sighs> so the milk is not the only thing getting sniffed in the right. smart fridge. Right. Very, I like what you did there, Mike. So... <laughs> They say that the smart home is insecure because nobody cares. This is a very... You guys should go read this article. Um, he, he, he addresses the article and structures it like a story 
about how the security role in an Internet of Things startup, how they're portrayed, and why we end up with, uh, as he puts it in the end, we end up with software. Um, how did he put it? Um, you end up with you know, no certificates. Um, it's not encrypted. Uh, and it's really vulnerable. And he calls the security person the junior VP for embedded system security. He says after his $10,000 per month take home, the rent leaves him just enough to live on Soylent plus whatever on offer in the company's canteen where every week is either vegan week or paleo week. <laughs> so, yeah, that's how this story rolls, dude. Like, it's, it's really a shot across the bow at uh, companies who are... Uh, using embedded uh, technology. He talks about making a, um, uh, an alarm clock, and he says the users in this scenario would get messages 14 minutes past midnight demanding 0.56 Bitcoin to switch off the message, and Nielsen thinks the top airing shows at 2 a.m. on a community radio station in West Bumcrack, Iowa, and your only content is speeches from YouTube by Julian Assange and Edward Snowden is how he describes things. It's a very interesting article. I'm not sure I agree with his approach on it. Um, but yeah. And he says, that's why debacles like the Samsung's great refrigerator disaster will keep happening. You know, we, we've talked about the way that home routers, the, the wireless routers keep, right? Somebody stamps out a chip once and uh, we're still using the same chipset mm -hmm. how many number of years later, right? Um, now that I've got a chance, we talked this about this last week, this concept of this minimum viable security. As I talk to more startups about it, you know, Jack, you brought up threat modeling. I, guys, listen, this is something that I'll, I'll pursue with you off, uh, off camera in over the coming months. But I, I think minimum viable security is something at least it's something I'm going to pursue, but as a mindset, not as a, not as a set of steps. And one of the things I'm trying to wrap my head around is, if you're a startup at this really early stage, what does a basic threat model look like? And how long should that take? And how do you take people that have no security background, possibly no tech background, they have an idea, they're excited, they don't understand what to ask for in chips, right? I mean, like, I think that's where we have some real opportunities in this. So, yeah, I mean, this, this story, this, this guy, uh, he, he likes his writing style. Um, mm. But... I don't think it's insecure because nobody cares. I think it's insecure because people who are testing with their minimum viable products, they, they don't even think about security because, because, because there's no accessible way to do it. Mm -hmm. We need to make it simpler. And then I, I, I got a concept from a buddy yesterday. There's a distinction between the minimum viable security, and he actually talked about putting a restriction on it that – you know, you need to restrict your business to what security you can provide at that point, at that price point type of thing. And then as, but think through where you might want to go. And then you're going to move from a minimum viable security to an operational security model or something to that I, effect. I, I think that's the critical point is that um, you can't, in startup mode, you can't get in the way of people shipping, right? right. Correct. However, if, Instead of trying to prevent people from shipping, if you can get them to understand building in the overhead to fix things later, right? And yes. That, that fix things later is not just security. It is, this is really cool. What if this takes off? Right. Do we want to Bingo. have to completely re-architect five times as we try to you know as we try to keep up with growth and part of that overhead that we've got for growth is going to allow us to secure our systems as we grow mm -hmm. and then they still ship with no security that's a victory right because at yep. least we can we can move forward uh, you know we can we've got down the path we've put the word out there and said let's make sure we can do this when we can Instead of just chipping with minimal, you know, with, with, you know, because if you ask a lot of people, what's the minimum viable security? Well, none. None. Right. <laughs> minimum viable yeah, security but, is none. Just ask Oracle. Ask Mary Ann Davidson. I'll tell you, some oh, of the wait. conversations <laughs> that I've had recently that have pleasantly surprised me is, is you say to one of these founders, and they've got an idea they're really passionate about, and you say, well, have you thought about what someone could do against your wishes? And they go, who would do that? And you say, well, there's people. But... Have you thought about think, it? 
The guy that and runs Ashley Madison. I heard he's a jerk. <laughs> um. Well, but but the funny thing is, you know, sometimes too, they and we we fall prey to this too. We're so fixated on solving the problem, we're so excited about it, and we and we spend so much time on it and energy that we don't think about well, well, who wouldn't do it this way? And and so what's interesting is that, as you pointed out, Jack, if we can just get people to. Think about it, have the conversation, spend a minimum amount of time on it, but then, right, because Paul, the, the question I ask everybody now anytime they do a chip, I got from how do you update it? Mm-hmm. Actually, I usually ask them who made it and how do you update it? Were, um, were, you, how, on the, were you on the call when, uh, on the show when we were talking about Google's new on yeah. hub? Yeah. yeah that's yeah, where I got I think, uh, yeah. step in the right direction there. So. Yeah. But, and, but see, this is the thing I find too. I mean, I, I want to extend uh, the uh, the optimism hour by a little bit. Is, is so we're seeing improvements, and yeah, they're never going to go as fast as we want them to. But we are seeing those improvements, and those are the models that we can hold out. So when when somebody says, "Well, no one cares," you go, "Well, actually, Google's kind of putting out something mm-hmm. that looks that looks useful on it. Let's let's talk about that, and what would that look like?" And we just need to give people the language. We need to make it more accessible for them. We need to be really simple. And, you know, like I, I, when I say minimum viable security, I don't mean here's a list of 27 things I expect you to do. I, I mean, here's a mindset. Here's a, here's a structure. Here's a way to think and talk about it. And, uh, and then, hey, we'll, we'll build on it from there. So I, I think it's, it's interesting. Yeah, hey, I, quick- I agree. The list of things that people should do doesn't always go over so well without the first part of, like you said, changing the mindset. The... Um, that's very insightful, uh, Michael. Wow. I'm, in I'm my in that. my story section, Jack, I put a story up there. Uh, no joke uh, for you. Uh, not for you. For anybody who was listening to that first part about how to con- it's how to connect with anybody you met in five questions, and um, it, it's actually pretty powerful. So wait, it's are they the, the same five stories. questions that we ask? They're <laughs> they're, they're not. But I will tell you what, that would totally ask work. Grabby, I can grabby. Sit down <laughs> far, and I, so if you were a serial killer. What is your weapon of choice? <laughs> that's, that's how you make friends. Maybe not the right kind of friends. Hey, maybe but, you uh, end up in a game of Ask Grabby yeah. Grabby. <laughs> you <laughs> never know. Especially if you're in Europe. I mean, because that's where it's popular. <laughs> 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 but anyway, if people want some suggestions, Jack, I stuck them under my stories. But um, you cool. can check it out. Um, so October 16th is our big show. Jack will not be here. Larry will be here. Hopefully, Kevin can make it down. Hopefully, Mike will be here in studio. I'm actually trying right now. I have yeah. a thing in, in Myrtle Beach on the 15th, so I'm trying to find a, like a flight, but I've blocked Excuses. the day. That's good. You should, you no. should come down. It's better when you're here, because then we can all play Ask Gravy Gravy is what I'm saying. <laughs> Do, but Paul, will you go first or second? Uh, you will have to find out when you get here. <laughs> Maybe both. So, let's, <laughs> so the 16th. You're, you're on the plane. I'm... Yeah. When do you land? I, I haven't booked the flights yet because I'm waiting for it all. I will be... You're in a good... I will be... Not good shape. Th- there will not be enough bandwidth in the airplane somewhere over the South Pacific no. to dial in. No. No, you're, oh, you're well. out. <clears throat> We're close. Sorry. No, no. It, it, like I said, I, I know Your my October schedule was so is, screwed. Yeah. My October and November are so screwed yeah. that it's it was no point in trying to work around mine. So come to the studio on October 16th if you're listening. The new It'll studio, right? Yeah, we're going to break studio. ground. We're going to break ground Ooh. next door. Yes. We're going to get this. <laughs> so we're going to have everyone come with sledgehammers and help us bake, take the wall down. That'd be awesome. I'm ready to smash something. Yeah, there, you should, there, Kevin. Uh, fun. There will be a bar with a sink. <laughs> when not Kevin right. gets angry. Bar with a sink. <laughs> bar oh with a sink. God. Maybe even an ice maker. We're going to. Yeah. And a dishwasher. I thought that was your job, That's, dishwasher. The dishwasher's <laughs> name is Chris, actually. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, thanks, everyone, for watching. It's been a fabulous episode. We get to see I'm the sorry many faces for my optimism. I right. got over it. It's, I'm better now. <laughs> we'll see everyone next week. Over and out. Over and out. <laughs>